Hi, my name is Sam Schiffman, and today I'm going to be talking to you about four programming paradigms. But even more than that, I'm hopefully going to convince you of two things. One, Dorothy was right, there is no place like home. And two, we can have our cake and eat it too. Before we dive into that, quickly about myself. I've been building software for more than 20 years, and I've worked in a number of industries, including finance, education, no-code platforms, and gig marketplaces. During that time, I played with a lot of technology. I actually got my start on a K-Pro 4, which didn't even have a hard drive. But that is really ancient history. Most of my work has actually been in Java. Not because I think it's the best language out there, but because that is what people have wanted to pay me for. But enough about me. Today I want to take you on a little trip down the Yellow Brick Road, and let the Wizard of Oz teach us about three of the most popular programming paradigms, and why they evolved. Along the way, Dorothy is going to lead us to some interesting places, which is going to let me talk a bit about a fourth, less well-known paradigm. Then we'll dive a little deeper into the reasons why we use one or another. Our journey starts with procedural programming. Procedural programming emerged in the 1960s, when high-level languages began to replace assembly and machine code. See, more powerful computers allowed for more complicated programs. Writing these programs as a long list of machine instructions was not going to work. So people created abstractions that allowed programs to be easier to write and organize. One of the ways they organized the code was to borrow a page from Turing and mathematics and start breaking it up into named reusable blocks called functions. Functions, just to level set, are named blocks of code that take inputs, do some calculation, and return a value. Now, older procedural languages like Pascal make a distinction between functions and procedures, where the latter do not return a value. Uh, this distinction has largely fallen by the wayside over time, but I mention it because it will come up again. Many of us would consider procedural programming languages antiquated and limited, much like Dorothy felt about her rural Kansas farm. And like Dorothy, we want to see what's over the rainbow. But why? Like Dorothy, developers faced an oncoming tornado. For software, that tornado was an even greater explosion in complexity. This chart shows the number of lines of code in commercial aircraft. The number of lines of code is a lousy measure for productivity, but I think it can be a good proxy for overall project complexity. So this is just one industry, but similar growth was about to hit all over the software world, and programs were only going to get more complex. Procedural programming is vulnerable to many problems in a complex system, but shared mutable state is one of the worst. State, if you don't already know, is the data a program is working with slash on. You can think of it this way. If the job of the program is to calculate a paycheck for an hourly employee, then the state is the number of hours they worked, the rate per hour, the employee's union status, and even the resulting amount they should be paid. In procedural programming, all of the state, at least all of it that really matters, can be seen from anywhere in the program, and any part of the program can mutate, i.e. change it. In small programs, it doesn't matter much, but as the complexity of the project grows, it becomes very hard to understand what is happening to that shared state. So people had the bright idea of bringing together the data and the functions in what they called objects. Packaged together, they would slay the evil witch of shared state. The people who came up with object-oriented programming, also called OOP, were looking for another layer of abstraction, and they found it by noticing that things in the real world would have state and do things. For example, you have a birth date, which is part of your state. You also have an age, which is a function of the difference between today and your birth date. The thing is that when people ask you how old you are, they don't care if you remember the number of years or if you do a quick calculation to figure it out. This was the insight of OOP. If a program could be made up of objects, then the state could be hidden from the rest of the program. So objects interact with each other by calling functions, but reasoning about the state can safely be done inside the object. This is referred to as encapsulation. This is all very good, but like the Wicked Wish of the West, shared state was out for revenge. Encapsulation is great in theory, but in the end, many programmers break it. In OOP, state is only supposed to be changed 
because of function calls. So programmers just added functions that let other parts of the program modify the object state. They even named them getters and setters. This practice has become so common that languages like C Sharp have done away with these functions and let the rest of the code refer to the state directly. We will talk more about why in a minute. But if object-oriented programming isn't defeating shared mutable state, then what are we to do? In Oz, Dorothy finds that water will take out the Wicked Witch. But while water will stop a computer from working, it doesn't really solve our problem. The current answer is to bring a new abstraction to bear, the latest kid on the block, functional programming. Functional programming poses the proposition that if shared mutable state is our problem, why not stop modifying the state? What we'll do instead is create more state. Look at it this way. In math, I can't make 2 be 4. It just doesn't make sense. However, I can write an expression that adds 2 and 2 to get 4. So functional programming, as the name more or less implies, does not allow for procedures, those functions in procedural programming that don't return a value. This is because these procedures would be unable to modify state and so would become no ops. The only way to do things of value in functional programming is to have a function, like 2 plus 2, which returns new state like 4 which can then be inputs to other functions. So what does this fractal have to do with anything? Well, it doesn't, but I think it is beautiful, and I think there's a lot of beauty in functional programming also. In functional programming, the idea is to think of functions as an algebra of operations. Yes, I said algebra, by which I mean a set of operations you can do to manipulate, but not mutate your state. We can then compose those simple operations to make more complicated ones. You know, on second thought, maybe fractals are a good analogy after all, since they make very pretty pictures by composing simple operations. Okay, time for a quick recap. We talked about how the Wicked Witch of shared mutable state caused us to go from procedural programming to object-oriented programming. But the witch's family was out for revenge, so we had to try again and invented functional programming. But when all is said and done, Dorothy discovered that the wizard was just an old man behind a curtain. If we look closely, we find that functional programming really isn't all that different from procedural programming. Sure, it stresses that the state should be immutable, but at its heart, it is still breaking up the problem into name blocks of code that we can reuse in different places. I guess Dorothy was right. There is no place like home. The problem is that mutable is only one part of shared mutable state, which is really only one of the problems with complexity. What if we could go back to the OOP solution, but solve the problem of breaking encapsulation? Well, it turns out somebody did. At about the same time object-oriented was invented, another abstraction was suggested. This was called the actor model. In the actor model, we ensure encapsulation by only allowing actors to talk via immutable messages. One actor cannot see another actor's state, let alone mutate it. All it can do is send a message, and the other actor can send a message back. There is a lot of implications here. For one, since an actor only communicates with messages, it can't assume that there is anyone receiving those messages, and it has to know what to do if no one is listening. This actually makes the whole system more resilient. All right, I can see your eyes rolling, and you're asking why, if the actor model is so amazing, don't we see more of it in the wild? Why isn't every programmer creating actors all the time? Well, if you remember back to in the beginning of this talk, I said I was going to do two things. One, tell you why Dorothy was right about there being no place like home. And two, have my cake and eat it too. So here goes. I'm going to both explain to you why you don't see more developers using the actor model, which is also why we break encapsulation all the time. And I'm going to show you that we build actors all the time in modern software. When I worked for ADP, I was building HR solutions. Our secret sauce was that we could do anything with hierarchies. We wanted to find rules based on where people live, what department they work in, who they report to, and so on. As long as you could group your employees into hierarchies, we could find out the right rule. However, when I talked to our implementation team, they said that our clients only ever gave us one hierarchy. That hurt, because that meant they were missing out on a lot of the power of our solutions. But when I thought about it, I realized that HR people probably don't arrange information in their heads the same way developers do. 
There are a number of ways people arrange information. To look at a few, imagine we have a stack of books to organize. Some people will look at them spatially, arrange them by the location they were written or where the story happens. Other people will sort them alphabetically by author or by physical size of the book. Other people might think more about when the books were written or about what time period they are about. A very common way to organize them would be to put them in the categories like the Dewey Decimal System does. And then some people will group them in groups that are in other groups that might still be in other groups. These people more naturally think in terms of hierarchies. I believe this is the key to being a good software developer. You need to be able to think about things as trees and split problems that way. For instance, a famous interview question is how do you debug a program if you don't have a debugger and you can't add logging? Well, you split the program in half and execute half of it. Whichever half fails, you split it again in half and execute it. And keep going until you isolate the line of code with the problem. This is the functional programming approach to solving problems. It's also the procedural programming approach. It's not the object-oriented or actor approach. OOP wants us to break the problem into a set of objects. We're always talking about the is a relationship when modeling problems in OOP. But at least in object-oriented we can cheat and still do many of the things that are inherently procedural in nature. In the actor model, we cannot. We really have to reason about the problem in what to most of us is an unnatural way. This is why I believe that the actor model hasn't caught on. Now you could say that if us developers were just smart enough to think in a different way, we could use the actor model. But then, why are we successful enough at writing software that it's taking over the world? I think there's something to be said for Dorothy's lesson. Home, in this case, how we naturally think, is not inherently bad. So now it's time to eat some cake, because I think that if you just change your perspective a little bit, you will agree that we do use the actor model all the time. We just call them microservices. I actually remember having this thought in the bad old days of EJBs. Back then we had service beans and entity beans, and I thought that if you put the entity beans and the service beans together, you get an actual object. Microservices can be defined in many ways, but at their heart they are saying, take this complex system and break it down into services that work together to solve the problem. The resulting microservices interact by sending immutable blobs of JSON or XML to each other over HTTP and getting back similar immutable blobs as responses. In fact, as we look at this list of characteristics of microservices from Martin Fowler, we see many of the same things we would say about actors. Just one example is that actors clearly decentralize data management. In both the actor model and microservices, the state is properly encapsulated from the rest of the system. My point is that object-oriented programming done right is really close to the actor model, but we are better able to apply both on the scale of services than in lower level code. So we should embrace microservices, but we should let the guts be as functional as possible. Thank you for listening. I'd love to know what you think. Am I completely off base with this developers think and hierarchies thing?